Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Special thank you to our ASL interpreter, Joel Guidry. And I'd like to have a warm welcome to my team that's joining me today. We have Dr. Consi Pedrosa, Chief of Student Support Services, Dr. Keisha Scarlett, Chief Academic Officer, James Bush, Chief of Equity, Partnerships and Engagement, Carrie Nicholson, Director of Student Support Services, and Deputy Rob Gannon for joining us today. They'll share updates about our planning for the fall. And I was remiss in not introducing myself. My name is Dr. Brent Jones, Superintendent of Seattle Public Schools. And our intent today is to talk about how we are going all in, in person for the fall. And one of the steps in doing, doing that is submitting the OSPI Required Academic and Student Wellbeing Recovery Plan. And today we'll have uh, Deputy Rob Gannon lead us through a uh, contextual introduction and moderate the questions that you all be asking later on in the presentation. So without further ado, Deputy Gannon, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here and joined by some outstanding colleagues. As Dr. Jones mentioned, we're here tonight to talk about the plan that we will submit to the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction, talking about how we'll pursue academic and student well-being. So a bit about this, it is an important exercise, but it's also a bureaucratic one. All school districts in the state of Washington are required to submit a plan. It's a requirement not just from the state, but also so that our district and other districts throughout the state can receive federal relief funds known as ESSER. This is part of the American Recovery Act. So it's an important step that we need to take so that those funds can come into the district and we can make the best possible use of them. We will be communicating much, much more over the coming weeks and months about what the fall will look like for your student. This plan is not about how it relates exactly to your individual student, but it is about all the things that the district is considering and preparing to do. Our effort today is to be as transparent as possible about this step so that we can continue to engage with all of you about what the future looks like and what those tangible important next steps are that are going to impact your family, your school community, and your student. One of the things that is guiding us is that we want to get back to in-person instruction because in-school instruction is what we do best and across the slate we believe it is best for our students. We expect that a majority of our families will want to return in person so that's what we're planning for. It's a practical exercise in many respects but we've also learned a lot over this past year and as we work to come back even stronger more student focused and ready to create the conditions for our students to thrive, we know that we have a large population of students and we need to attend to many, many different needs, as well as supporting our staff and educators throughout the system. Our staff is committed to spending time on those things that matter most for our students, high quality instruction, a welcoming classroom, and safe and healthy learning environments for everyone. These next few months will be a heavy lift to engage that cliche. There's a lot of work that we need to do, but our staff is committed to engaging with all of you and sharing our progress, that we make the most of the next 98 days before the school starts, so we hear from you, work with you, and talk to you about how we're getting prepared and ready to make it the best school year ever. Together, uh, our goal is to reimagine public education providing interesting, rigorous, and culturally responsive learning. A public education that empowers all of our students to realize their dreams and build the future that they deserve. One other important step that has to happen, our school board will need to vote on the academic and student well-being recovery plan that we're discussing today. We hope they'll take that action tomorrow night at their scheduled board meeting. Across that action and across the conversation we'll have tonight, we're going to talk about major themes. I'm going to introduce the themes broadly, but pass it over to some of my colleagues who will speak in detail about what we mean. But the major themes are first and foremost, student well-being. Next, student and family voice. 
third, professional learning. Fourth, recovery and acceleration. Fifth, diagnostic assessment tools. And sixth, community partnerships. Those are the broad themes. And from my colleagues, you'll hear some of the plans that we have ready to go and some of the things that we'll need more feedback on. So I'm now going to pass it over to the team to share those details. We look forward to receiving your questions across the evening. Uh, and the link to share those questions will be coming up in the chat. But now I'm going to turn it over to my brilliant colleague, Dr. Kansi Pedroza. Please take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Kansi Pedroza, Chief of Student Support Services. And thank you for all of you for joining us today. We know we are approaching the end of a very challenging year. This year has been hard for our students, our families, and our staff. Even as we prepare to return to in-person in the fall, we do not yet know uh, the full impact from the trauma of the pandemic on our students, which is why we are taking extra steps to focus on student wellness. Seattle Public Schools is developing a culture of care, a plan to support the well-being of all of our students during the 21-22 school year. We're planning to incorporate additional supports for students into their learning this fall. Supports like monthly community circles, restorative practices, social, emotional, and trauma-informed lessons, and supports incorporated into daily instruction. We also want to make sure school leaders and educators have clear processes on how to identify students in crisis and access appropriate supports for them. We will continue to strengthen our partnerships with community-based organizations and culturally relevant agencies with a focus on mental health and counseling. We will have clear contact information and a process of, for schools who do not have a counselor, a social worker, or care, and, and, or care coordination staffing in their buildings to get support for students. We will be evaluating the effectiveness of these supports and interventions using student and family climate surveys. In addition to the trauma support specifically related to the COVID-19 school closures, we will continue to focus intentionally on social emotional learning next year by establishing two-way communication with students, family, and community partners regarding SEL practices. We will be partnering with community groups and stakeholders to align SEL practices to supports available outside of the school day and partner with the City of Seattle levy funded schools to make sure all supports are anti-racist. We will also work with content specialists to embed SEL skills across all content areas and align social justice standards to SEL lessons and practices. To truly develop a culture of care, we need to coordinate individual student supports, classroom and whole school supports, and work with community partners to extend that care into students' lives outside of school. And now I'll hand this over to Dr. Keisha Scarlett, our Chief Academic Officer. Thank you so much, Dr. Pedroza. <laughs> Before giving you all an overview of a couple of more things, I'd like to discuss our instructional model for next year. Based on state requirements from the governor and state superintendent, as well as the district's desire to best serve our students, SPS is planning to have five full days of in-person instruction at all 104 schools this fall. We are committed to working with our community and staff to open schools and welcome back all students who wish to return to in-person learning. We are also developing virtual options for students who decide to stay fully remote. More information about these virtual options will be communicated to families very soon. Now, the first thing from the plan that I'll be going over is called recovery and acceleration. Student learning depends on a strong partnership between families and our educators. Our school next school year, staff will be focused on supporting growth along each student's individual learning path in collaboration with parents and caregivers. We will invest in enhanced academic supports, community partnerships, and extended learning opportunities to support these efforts, as well as continued efforts to expand access to core instruction for our multilingual students. There will also be additional target resources we will provide to the 13 priority schools 
where more than 50% of the district's K through three African American boys are enrolled. We will also begin the process of decolonizing social studies with the district wide implementation of the since time immemorial American Indian studies course, black studies and ethnic studies. And finally, college and career readiness efforts included include continued partnerships with um, an organization called Equal Opportunity Schools, our program Naviance, our Office of African American Male Achievement, special education, career and technical education, and others to improve supports for students navigating pathways to post-secondary success. The next theme from this OSPI plan is diagnostic assessment tools. So in other words, this is how we will be collecting data on student progress and wellness. We are currently developing a consistent assessment calendar to help us track progress toward the goals in our strategic plan, Seattle Excellence. Our early literacy screener will also be piloted this year to closely monitor reading instruction progress. Additionally, a ninth grade success tracker is being developed and will be piloted in the 2021-22 school year to ensure schools are supporting students in grade nine toward post-secondary readiness. And schools will also have new college and career readiness reports so that they have student credit earning and pathway completion data. We also have improved grading guidance and reports to help schools promote equity minded grading practice as well as social emotional skills. And finally, the school climate survey we will use to establish a baseline for assessing school connectedness, belonging and engagement. Now the final theme I'll go over is professional learning. Professional development will be focused on wellness and student academic outcomes. First, we will be providing training on cultural of culture of care practices that Dr. Pedroza previously mentioned and support for culturally responsive instruction. SPS also requires that all K-3 teachers um, participate in the course on the science of reading that has been identified as the best practice instructional approaches to teaching reading. There will be continued professional learning on recent curricular adoptions for science K through 12, mathematics six through eight, ELA K through five and Spanish six through 12, as well as social emotional learning sessions focused on educator practices, staff wellness and anti-racist social emotional learning approaches for students. These professional development sessions will provide detailed guidance on curriculum assessment and instruction to, to promote culturally relevant anti-racist practices and to maintain high standards of standards-based expectations for all students. I look forward to answering your questions a little bit later and now I'll pass to James Bush, our Chief of Equity, Partnerships and, en and Engagement. Thank you, Dr. Scarlett. And Yes, my name is James Bush and I serve as the Chief of Equity Partnerships and Engagement. As a, as a division and as a district, we are committed to ensuring that student and family voices are centered in our planning moving forward. We will continue our ongoing engagement efforts with community-based organizations that primarily serve students of color furthest from educational justice and their families. Recent, recent family engagement efforts, including off the Office of African-American Male Achievements, Listening and Learning Tours, uh, English learning community meetings, info sessions for English language learner assessments, and youth participatory action research, and more have helped shape our recovery plan. Also a part of our district's recovery plan, we have held community forums organized by affinity groups to hear from our families of students with IEPs and yeah. students uh, furthest from educational justice about their experience with remote learning, in-person services, and what they would like to see occur in the fall. For community partnerships, we continue to partner with the City of Seattle and King County Public Health to support the school day and out of school time programming in partnership with our school staff and our community based organizations, including services that provide academic intervention, social emotional learning, identity development, family support and mental, mental and physical health programming. We have partnership with 
18 licensed child care providers at 68 of our elementary and K-8 schools that continue to provide academic support, youth development, enrichment, and supports in supporting students accessing our remote learning options. Additionally, SPS partners with another 450 organizations that provide a wide variety of programming and supports for our shared students. Thank you, and now I'll pass uh, us on to our Director of Student Supports, Carrie Nicholson. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Chief Bush. Um, hi, I'm Dr. Carrie Nicholson, Interim Director of Health Policy, Procedures, and Practices. And I want to begin by just stating that we have learned a lot over this past year. We've learned and what we have learned is going to help propel us forward to reopening schools for the 21-22 school year. We've learned a lot about ourselves as individuals, as a community, as a district, and we've learned a lot about COVID-19. COVID-19 has taught me to be more compassionate, but it has also taught me the imperative, if not a new skill set, for being flexible yet nimble. And I can think, and I think that we perhaps we all can agree that we've come to learn that our understanding of COVID-19 is going to continue to evolve. The district has learned that as a result of this evolving knowledge, that we must anticipate that there will be changes in the guidance. Therefore, we are positioned and prepared to respond whenever the Department of Health or Public Health, Seattle and King County release updates to their school guidance. Our agility or flexibility in responding to this new knowledge ensures that SPS health and safety protocols consider and align with the most up-to-date local and state health guidance. So why does this even matter? It matters because as a district, we have also learned that following the Department of Health and Public Health guidance works. Our staff, our students and families have demonstrated a strong commitment to following SPS health and safety protocols. And as a result, we have successfully returned students to in-person learning without experiencing widespread outbreaks of COVID-19 in our schools. In fact, the cases that we have seen is merely a reflection of the high level of viral transmission that we have been experiencing in King County. When there is a case, the dedicated and experienced COVID contact tracing team of school nurses quickly identifies and responds to all school related COVID exposures. The team shares this information with public health, who in turn serves as the lead investigator. As a district, we've also learned to work across departments, across communities and across organizations. And in my opinion, we are better and stronger because of this collaboration. SPS has partnered with Seattle Indian Health Board, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, UW Medicine, City of Seattle, Public Health, and the Seattle Fire Department to provide vaccines to SPS staff, our students, and families. And I am thrilled to share that during just a one week period in March, over 1,000 Seattle Public School staff received a COVID vaccine. And last week, the Seattle Fire Department vaccinated over 2,600 individuals at Seattle City SPS vaccine clinics that are being hosted at schools across the district. This is important because it means that students are being given the opportunity to receive both doses of the vaccine before the end of the school year. So given our success thus far, what can we expect for next school year? The Department of Health released guidance on May 13 to help schools begin planning for returning to in-person learning next fall. The document provides insight into the health and safety requirements for the upcoming 21-22 school year. Significant changes for next school year include the removal of a health, daily health screening requirement for students, staff, and visitors. And additionally, the Department of Health provided clarity on physical distancing requirements. This change provides districts with flexibility to accommodate all students who want full-time in-person learning. But according to our current um, labor agreement, SPS will continue to follow our six feet of physical distance, distancing requirement for the remainder of the year. 
However, we will begin to work towards creating classroom spaces to accommodate more students using the three feet physical distancing guidance to the greatest extent possible. The majority of the health and safety requirements in the newly released document remain unchanged and in effect for next school year. This includes universal and correct wearing of face coverings or masks for all staff, students and visitors, cleaning and disinfecting, hand washing and health hygiene, responding to cases or suspected cases of COVID-19, and reporting cases and outbreaks and working with public health. Going forward, you can expect SPS to continue building upon our strong health and safety protocol foundation. You can also expect SPS will continue to seek opportunities to partner across organizations to support the health and the well being of our school community. And finally, you can expect that SPS will remain committed to following the science and the guidance of our state and local health officials, as well as remaining flexible and prepared to adjust with the evolution of this guidance as we plan for the 21-22 school year. Thank you for your time. And at this moment, we will go ahead and move over to a dedicated time for answering questions. So a quick thank you to all my colleagues and thank you most recently to Dr. Nicholson for that great update. Uh, you'll see that all my colleagues have joined me back on screen and a number of your questions have come in. Uh, some of them have been aggregated, so I'm going to moderate and send them along to uh, each of them who are best situated to answer them. So Dr. Scarlett, a number of questions coming through the chat related to remote learning options. Uh, and let me preface this by saying, uh, in, in an interest to getting as many questions answered as possible, if we could give brief answers, that would be great. But uh, Dr. Scarlett and Dr. Pedroza, could you give us a little information on remote learning options as we gear up for the fall? Yes, um, we do realize that some families will need or require or want um, remote options um, for their students. So we will have remote options in the in the, um, in terms of uh, virtual options, actually, and so. Um, we've not um, fully fleshed out what grade levels that will encompass. Will it be from K through 12 or P through 12? And so we're still working on that. And so that information will be shared um, with families coming up very soon. But there will be some um, number of remote options that are available. Um, and we are encouraging all of our families to return, um, if at all possible, to in-person learning because that's what we do best. So um, we are excited to have our families return in buildings. Our school leaders and educators are excited as well for that. So that is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Scarlett. Dr. Pedroza, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I was just going to add that we are working very close in partnership with uh, Dr. Scarlett's team to ensure that um, special education services and um, level four plans are incorporated into um, any remote options um, that are provided to students um, this fall. Excellent. So Dr. Pedroza, while you're uh, front and center, a uh, question about middle school sports. Uh, what is the likelihood that our students will be engaging in athletics in the middle schools? Yes, we are already planning for that. Um, it was one of the things that we have told uh, and talked with the middle school principals and the staff currently. And so we're in the process of planning for middle school athletics this fall. Excellent. I'm sure there are many athletes out there excited about that good news. Uh, let me jump to a transportation question. Uh, questions about will bus service be provided to our schools in the fall? And I think I can answer that with a simple yes. Uh, our transportation team is actively planning to provide all the buses that are necessary to get students to their schools. Um, and we're optimistic, right? We know that that was a challenge across the, the past year. Um, but with a full return, we believe that we'll have better capacity and more drivers available to be in the buses getting students to where they need to be. I'm going to pop to another question here. There's all sorts of questions coming in, so I'm inexperienced as a moderator here. Um, 
Dr. Nicholson, a uh, question about will students be required to wear a mask in the fall? Can you maybe reiterate what you said earlier in your health update and, and give us a sense of masks in the fall? Yeah, certainly. Great question. So right now the guidance directs us that all students, staff, and visitors will be required to wear a face covering um, while at school. So um, that guidance remains the same and, and stay tuned. Um, but for now, that was the guidance that we're working from. Great, thank you. Let's see, there's a question about the district collecting all devices and hotspots at the end of the year. Would working on school assignments digitally be no longer available if you choose the in-person option? So I'm going to answer the first part of that question, uh, and then I'll turn to Dr. Scarlett and Dr. Pedroza to help talk about what the, the future of electronic learning looks like with laptops and other devices. So one of the things that we will need to do as a district is bring back all of those laptops so we can get them refreshed and ready for the next academic year. So that's quite an undertaking given the number that we issued. Uh, but we are going to try and do that with all due sensitivity to the families and especially the student learners, not cutting them off from the access they need. But to be clear, we're working on that plan and figuring out how to roll it out, making sure those laptops are available and ready for the coming academic year. Dr. Scarlett and Dr. Pedroza, anything you'd like to add about the importance of laptops supporting the educational efforts? Yeah, I'll just add one thing and then I'll pass it to Dr. Scarlett. Um, our intention as a district has always been to ha be a one-to-one -one device district. So um, the pandemic just sped up that process for us and we're happy that all the students have one-to-one -one devices. So um, there is a technology plan in terms of supporting what that looks like for academics moving forward. And I'll pass it to Dr. Scarlett if she wants to add anything. Yeah, one key role that we play is also to ensure that we are um, pursuing equity through a variety of mechanisms. One of them is information poverty is an actual inequity. And um, there is nothing that's laid bare um, um, until recently um, within COVID about what is happening um, to communities um, that are impacted by um, not having access to information. And so um, it is important for us to be a one-to-one -one district. Our educators have worked really hard to build new capacities to be able to um, um, to give instruction that is both remotely, but also um, using the devices. And we want to be able to build upon that as we move forward with curriculum and with instruction and teaching and learning as well. So I'm super excited about, about the future of SPS as a one-to-one -one district. Thanks, Dr. Scarlett, Dr. Joseph. Uh, bouncing around topic to topic here, but uh, a question about will the district hire more counselors and more nurses to support the return in the fall. So Dr. Nicholson referred a little bit to this and Dr. Pedroza, I know you and I have talked about this. Um, can one of the two of you answer the question and the other amplify it? Yeah, I'll answer just the part about some of the counselors um, supports. Um, one of the things we're working on in our uh, culture of care planning for the fall is additional staffing. Um, how that exactly rolls out and looks like is is going to be uh, up to the because we have 104 schools. Um, but one of our goals is to ensure because uh, we provide coordination and care for all of our schools and we want to make sure that all of the schools have access to some of the resources that we have but getting some staffing additional staffing will be incorporated into the planning and that includes some counselors and social workers moving forward and then in regards to nurses i'll pass that on to uh, dr nicholson yeah i'm fortunate here that you know i think every every student deserves a school nurse right full time every day um, and but right now it is more of an adjustment of um, the, our work our, um, to align with the COVID work, right? So we've had to adjust how we do that work. And part of what we've done is that we do have that specialized group of nurses who are performing contact tracing and doing a lot of COVID work. But as far as additions um, to nurses in the building at this time, um, I'm, I'm sad to say that would be no. Um, but we are, our work is definitely aligned and focused on COVID and supporting our students and our staff and our school communities as nurses. Thank you both for that. Uh, interesting question. I'm not sure I've encountered this one yet, but it's an important one. 
will parent volunteers be allowed back in buildings? I'm going to turn to my colleagues and see which one is best capable of fielding that. Well, I can take a stab at it. I think as we watch the guidance adjust and, and accommodate for allowing more students into the spaces, we would align with, with the recommendations in the guidance from public health and otherwise, depending on community transmission. But we rely on volunteers. We appreciate our volunteers and, and so certainly we'll look to the guidance on how to make that happen going forward into the next school year. Excellent, thank you. Uh, one re a question regarding special education, so I'll turn to Dr. Pedroza. Has the special education department prepared a plan for the recovery services that are required for students with IEPs and 504 plans? So Dr. Pedroza, you know that one also well. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, I'll say the special education department and the leadership team has developed a recovery plan. They have been following the guidance from OSPI. Um, that plan is has been submitted and it's actually posted. Um, I believe uh, with supporting with our case managers, they're getting all of that information. Um, and in addition, we will be sending out a parent communication with updates on the process. And so that's going to be coming out shortly, I believe within the next uh, two weeks or so. Great, thank you. Uh, a couple of conventional questions. Uh, people asking about will class sizes be limited and people asking about bell times. So uh, Dr. Scarlett and Dr. Pedroza, can you tackle those? I think that's a good opportunity for us to put some clarity out there. Yeah, for sure. Class sizes, we're expecting them to be pretty similar to what they are right now, or to what they were pre-pandemic. Um, so um, we don't have any specific guidance um, yet about what class sizes um, should be, but um, we are anticipating that we'll have um, pretty typical um, class sizes for next year. And um, um, Deputy um, Gannon, what is the last part of that, the second part of that question? I think people are curious about bell times. When will we oh, start school? Thank you so much. Yeah, so we will go to pre back to pre-pandemic bell times. Yeah. So you can expect that the bell time that you had grown accustomed to um, would be the bell time. Um, and if your students are new in the school, then it would be um, those um, pre-pandemic bell times that we would go back to. Yes. Thank you. So let me pause here and say I think we've run out of time for questions. Uh, but this has been a really important session for all of us. I hope that we've shared relevant information with you. I know that your questions have been relevant to us, and I want to end this with a couple of remarks. First, we are deeply grateful for all the information that is coming to us, the questions from students, from families, from educators, from community leaders and community-based organizations. Our goal is to deliver the best possible service. Our goal is to return to the fall better than ever. And we know that your feedback enriches that effort. So a heartfelt thank you to all of you. And an important piece, we have more to do in this space. This is about gathering feedback tonight on a plan that we are submitting to the State Superintendent of Public Instruction. But it is the days ahead that we are most focused on, trying to figure out how we stay continually connected to our school communities, the learners that are anxious to re-engage in person, and all that it takes to support a healthy, thriving school system. Our work of engagement is not over tonight. In fact, it, it really just begins and we're gonna ramp it up even more over the weeks and months ahead. Final point, our goal is to continually communicate with you what we know so that it can inform your family and your circumstances and get your student learner ready to go for fall. We're excited about the next 98 days as we get ready and we hope you will join us in this journey and make it the best best year ever. So I just wanna close again by saying thank you to my colleagues. Thank you to our interpreter who helped so much tonight. Thank you to all the staff behind the scenes that pulled off this production. And finally, thank you all for taking time out of your evenings to join us tonight, to listen to what we have to share and for taking advantage of future opportunities to be with us. Thank you, we look forward to the year ahead and we are grateful to be here in service to this community. Have a good night, everyone.